-hmm. Never a dull day with Shobha Day, and it certainly seems true with now the latest book, which is called Just That. Shobha, congratulations on this Thank book. Thank you. Uh, how do you do it, really? I mean, you prolific is one way to describe you, and you seem to kind of change the definition of it every time you come out with this new book, which is so close to the last one. But tell us more about this one. Well, this one is a compilation of my columns. I've been writing on gender for over 35 years. Mm. I've been writing in the week on gender, a column called The Sexes, for over 25 years. So when the publishers made an offer that I couldn't refuse, which was to put it all together in, <coughs> in a compilation, I thought it was a good idea. A, because it's important to be able to out gender in a way, mm -hmm. to make it uh, the centerpiece of um, our conversation more and more. And uh, some of the concerns that I have felt passionately about are in those columns, even the early columns. It's a kind of consistent way of expressing something that means a lot to me. Right. So this book was a cakewalk, it's a piece of toast. It's just someone putting columns together, me writing a snappy introduction, and uh, we're good to go. So, But it's fabulous, you know, like I met uh, Lord Meghnath Desai when I was walking in, and that word prolific always makes me a little wary because it's kind of loaded. You know, what, what do people mean when they're saying that to me? Are they saying you write too much or uh, <laughs> are, they, are they paying me a compliment or what? And I said, well, he also said the same thing. Oh, you have a new book. And I defensively explained that it's actually a collection of columns. Right. So I said, the idea is to have a book out there and to make sure it sells. I said, absolutely, we're on the same page there. Well, exactly. I was having this conversation with him, yeah. and he was talking about how he lives two different lives in the UK and yeah. in India. Yeah. He says in India, this entire drive at being able to be seen out there doing that, the entire marketing exercise, is a huge part of what we are. Yes, is it this is. true? It is true, but I um, I need to contradict him a little because even our darling V.S. Naipaul is obliged to perform uh, and at uh, all the road shows. You right. cannot today have a book out there and not promote it. It's as simple as that. It's a requirement. It's a very competitive environment. Uh, publishers are scrambling just to stay ahead of the game, to stay in the game for that matter, uh, with Kindle and everything else and people self-publishing. You know, the whole ball game in a way has changed, publishing. So if you're not there to promote your book, then honey, you're in the wrong business. It's like promoting any product. It's your product. They call it a product now. <laughs> and uh, you should be proud of it, and you should enjoy the uh, promoting it. It can be very tiring. But for me, uh, my wrist never aches when I'm signing my own copies. No? I can tell you that. No, it's a lovely feeling. But how has it changed over a period of time, Shobha? Because you've been at it for a long time. Yes. And like you said, so much has changed. Yes. The way we consume our books, the way uh, you know they're yeah. produced. Uh, yes. The self-publishing route is one yeah. very strong route, and you know, Suni I met yesterday, Suni yeah. Tharapurvala, she has, she's a strong proponent of self-publishing books. Sure. You haven't thought of that? No, I mean, I don't have either the skill or the infrastructure or the desire to do it, and so long as I have publishers willing to pay me for my work, I don't see why I should self-publish, though perhaps I'll make much more money doing it. <laughs> it's a smarter idea, I agree with Suni to that extent. Except that it's an idea that I don't think I could see through. I'm not a spreadsheets author, and I'm very impressed by those who are. Uh, the, new, uh, the new generation of young writers, they see it as um, a vocational obligation to track every copy. I cannot do it. Once the book is written, it's out there in the public domain, I disconnect, it's no longer my book, it's out there. And I also believe every book comes with its own takdeer. It sells, and it sells as many copies as it's meant to sell. But there are these uh, new boys on the block, and I admire them hugely, whether it's an Amish Tripathi or an Ashwin Shangi. All of them have a business model in place when they write a book. Mm. They start with the business model first and then write the book, and it has to fit into that business model. They track every copy, and I was uh, next to one of these very bright boys on a flight going to a lit fest, and he said that, do you know last week your Nielsen rating was such and such? I said, no. I said, how come you know it? He said, I track everybody else's books too. And it's fantastic. He said, do you know the names of the managers who sell your books in, say, Patna, in the bookstore? I said, no, do you? He said, are you bet? He said, I'm, I, I talk to them constantly. We are in, in email contact. They are on WhatsApp. Unless you do that, those are the guys who put your books uh, in a way, in a display that uh, makes them jump out at uh, someone who is a walk-in person. 
And if you're not doing that, then you know, chances are no matter what kind of a book you write, it's going to be on that back shelf. So I seriously considered distributing laddus to crossword and then I said, <laughs> nah, not for me. But Shobha, no. you mentioned that you know, a book is a product. You seem to be okay with that. But also, the people who write those books are yes. thought of as products as well, to a large extent. And you don't seem to have a problem with that? So be it. Uh, I really don't have a problem with it because uh, from the time I started writing, my, from it was over 25 years ago, my, when my first book came out, I mean, I was writing much before that. It was made very clear to me, uh, Penguin India had just established themselves in India. They were looking for star authors. And part of that was to go out there and give those interviews and appear on television shows and talk about your book. Uh, I was completely okay with it because a lot of effort goes into the writing of a book, no matter what that book is. And it's uh, your commitment to that book. And if you happen to be a reasonably marketable author, then why should you shy away from what is good for the book, it's good for you, it's good for the publisher, it's good for the readers. I have no problems with it. You know, the one challenge that um, would be to this entire debate, uh, when I was speaking to Farooq Dhondi, he says he has this conversation, he's a great friend of Mr. Naipaul, and he says that, you know, will you be remembered? And how will you be remembered through those books? Will they last over a period of time? That is the question. And that is a concern for many writers especially from that era. Does that bother you sometimes that, you know, how you're going to be remembered and whether they, these books are going to last over a period of time? Never. Does that cross your mind? Never. I'm a creature of the moment. I love what I'm doing right this second. I'm enjoying talking to you. Uh, there's a new book out there a few meters from where we are sitting. I hope it sells and I hope it sells great, but that's all it matters to me. I'll be on to my next book, my next project, my next blog. There's so much more to life, I think. And in any case, you have no control over uh, the destiny of your books and whether you're going to be remembered. It shows a fragility of some sort, a vulnerability. It's a thin skin or an ego, which I've never had that problem at all. I mean, posterity, I mean, come on, who needs it? I'll be dead and gone. What happens to those books? What do I care? You don't want to leave behind a no, legend. no, I'm, I've done my bit. I've enjoyed it. Hmm. I like to really believe that the process of writing that book was so much more exciting than whether people will read it after I'm dead and gone. I mean, how is that going to thrill me? I'm getting a thrill signing books today, downstairs, looking forward to my next book. Whether these books outlast me or not, if I were to preoccupy myself with that, then I'll turn into a nightfall. <laughs> and is that a scary, scary thought? Yes, it is. <laughs> Indeed scary. It's interesting that you say that, He's Shobha. so fraught, you know. I, I would never want to be that. And he looks tormented and tortured at all times. And of course, he's a genius. I mean, we, I can't even talk of myself in the same breath. That's not the point. But regardless, I would never want to be in that kind of a situation where I'm preoccupied and obsessed with how posterity will judge me or whether there will be a posterity at all for my books. Shobha, just going ahead and perhaps in going ahead, looking back, the evolution that you've seen of yourself, Shobha Day, as a person over a period of time, has it always been in the moment that you've decided that this is how I see it go and I'm going to enjoy doing this, so I'll, that's how. Or you've consciously tried to build what Shobha Day is thought of today. There's no way you can do it. People may say anything, you know, that, oh, uh, so-and-so is um, the empress of reinvention. I'm not talking about myself. I'm talking about, say, a rock star. Madonna. Like a Madonna. Yeah, exactly. A Madonna is a Madonna. There's one in a century. Uh, Lady Gaga is not a Madonna. It can never be her. Because Madonna already did it. She's done it, and she's done it better than almost anybody else. So you cannot plan reinvention. It's either something that's organic to your personality, to yourself. Hmm. In my case, I get bored very easily. My boredom threshold is pretty low. Right. So I do stuff that excites me personally. I have to be engaged in something in a way that's rapturous. <laughs> Nothing less will do. <laughs> and in the process, if new stuff happens, if new ideas pop up, I will go with that only because I'm excited, not because I've sat there and I've drawn a little map and said, OK, I've done this for five years. I'm going to do something else for the next two years. And then will come the reinvention plan, and I'll present myself in a new avatar. Also, I think it's important 
to be a risk taker. I enjoy risks. Mm. I mean, life would be very dull if there wasn't that awful risk around the corner which say, oh my God, I'm going to fall flat on my face doing this, but I want to do it. So if someone throws a completely preposterous idea at me, and if that idea appeals to me, I'll say, why not? I'll go for it. What's the worst? It won't work, right? But at least I'll have tried. Was it a risk uh, to write the way you did about uh, the new RBI governor? It was fun. It was a spoof. And, you know, in India, we take ourselves a bit too seriously. I mean, it's, uh, uh, satire is not understood. And uh, a woman also who writes in an irreverent manner and about the, uh, I mean, he's only a professional doing his job. I mean, okay, he's the RBI gov. So what? I mean, we are all professionals uh, doing our jobs. And it, it was seen as maybe a sexist comment. Of course, it's a sexist comment. I mean, I've been at the receiving end of sexist comments all my life. <laughs> so, I mean, you, you know, handle it. You <laughs> take it in your stride. But it caused the sort of reverberations in the corporate world I couldn't have believed. I mean, incredible people said, how could you? How did you? And so on. I mean, you know, I was asked to write a column. They pursued me, the editors. I was in Goa having a harmless little vacation, family time, and they kept at it and at it and at it. I, got, I came back. I had um, an hour and a half for that deadline. I, I sort of went, hammered it out, and it was done. And I, I think it was terrific fun. I thought it was great fun. What, this brief was given to you, saying that you need to write about the new RBI? No, or the you, brief you was as in, we want, we're doing a piece on Raghu. I've never met him, by the way. And uh, right. not, the, not before I wrote it, not after. And I have not the slightest bit of curiosity or desire to meet him. If I do, I think he might be a little embarrassed because <laughs> from all accounts, he's a reticent uh, and a, a yes. conservative guy. Yes. Uh, but none of this was known to me and it wouldn't have mattered. The point is that he is being projected as a rock star. And uh, when it was interesting because I met um, a, a, an Australian senior journalist right after that. And by the way, this, this was discussed in the world press I mean, about the uh, Reserve <laughs> Bank governor being uh, positioned in this way. And so when he came to meet me, he had printouts of all their previous, um, the, their equivalent of the Reserve Bank governors. Sure, sure. And he showed them, they all looked like toads. And he said, no wonder you wrote about this guy the way you did. <laughs> so he got it. You know what I mean? He doesn't look like a Reserve Bank uh, governor. Right. Everybody else in the world looks like a Reserve Bank governor is meant to look like. So in that sense, he was breaking through the stereotype, breaking the mold. It was fun. But getting flack for it, Shobha, obviously you didn't uh, bargain for it. And once you got it, because like you said, when you started out, you know, yeah. people will say things and people will call you prolific and you'll wonder what exactly do they mean. But does so, the flack matter? I mean, how does it matter? I on hindsight, but when you get it immediately after, you might think, oh, what have I done? No, never, never. Never. You should be confident enough about what you're saying. And if after 40 years in the business I'm not, I have no business to be where I am. So you must be able to, A, stand by every word of what you write, and I'm happy to do it. Well, so the flag, it's not my problem. It's if someone doesn't get it, it's their problem. <laughs> Yes. This wouldn't be the first time, would it, Shobha? I mean, no. I'm citing this one instance because no. it has been so huge. Yeah. But of course, you know, you have been controversial and you revel in that. It's perhaps. not about, it's not at all about whether I enjoy it. It is who I am. So, you know, guys, deal with it because I have. How so, do you define this? Being sensational? How do you define no, it? No, it's, it's how I think. It's how I live my life. It's what I believe. It's what I do. And at the end of it all, if at the end of... 40 years, I'm still a columnist in the national press and get a lot of reactions which are all also very wonderful. I must be doing something right, I think. <laughs> and you're adapting to new media so well, Shobha. And you thought yeah, it's important to be able to do that? Well, as a dinosaur, it's important to not completely become a dinosaur, uh, as uh, some of my contemporaries have become. So I don't want to be T-Rex. I want to be Shobha Day. I want to be able to do it and stay on top of the game. I know a time that I, I was talking to you, Shobha, and you said you will still want to write things down with pen and paper. I still do. You still do that? Yeah, I love it. It's very sensual. I love it. Is that why? Or is it yeah, just that sensual. you don't want to no, kind I've of give switched. up? No, I've switched. I mean, I've switched oh, you almost have. totally. Right. Uh, uh, I mean, almost 90% uh, of what I do now is essentially the way it's meant to be done in today's day and age, uh, there are no shortcuts there. So if I'm on Twitter, if I'm blogging, if I'm um, writing my manuscripts, my columns, um, it's all the way one does it on a laptop. But I don't enjoy it at all. It's uh, impersonal. Right. 
it's mechanical, I don't like the sound, I don't like any of it. <laughs> and I keep thinking, oh my God, I mean, listen, look at the pleasure one derives, I do. When you are holding that pen and it's moving across paper and you're seeing your words form, I just find that very sexy. You wrote that Raghuram Rajan article in an hour and a half, I think. Is yeah, that what I you write said? most of my stuff. And would you much. have been able to do that? Oh, you actually wrote that with pen? No, I didn't. No, you wrote I it. I keyed it in. But so would I, you take the I same amount of time? Yeah, uh, because I, uh, there are really no rewrites in my life. Mm -hmm. uh, and that's a big statement. <laughs> uh, it comes out boom or it doesn't. Right. So, so far, the booms have been pretty good. And they outnumber the uh. So, you know, this is my natural rhythm. This is how I've always written. And I don't see that changing now. So the Raghu piece came out in one blob, as, as do my books, as do my blogs, as do uh, everything else that I write. It, it flows like the Ganga, thank God, and may it flow on. But if I were to try and change that rhythm, I don't really believe that it will be qualitatively better. Right. It may be different, but not necessarily better. So would it be fair to say that this is the credo of your life, Shobha, that you don't want to rewrite any part of it? That it, it is what of my life? The credo of your the life. The credo of my life. That you do not, it's not, do about not care to rewrite anything. It's not a credo that's like a religious thing that I said I will not rewrite out of a sense of arrogance. I write very spontaneously. And it's no, never I just don't mean writing. I'm talking about everything else in, in life. Everything that you've done and spend quite a lot. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, there are no retakes. No? No. No, I like it that way. That's fantastic. Yeah. We hope to see a lot more of Shobade just the way she is. Super, thank you. Thank Lovely you so interview. Much. Thank, thank you. you.